Hello, and welcome uh, everyone to another Columbia Alumni Association Columbia at Home web series, webinar series. My name is Elise Oxendine, and I'm a graduate of the School of the Arts class of 2011 and a new board member. We are so happy to have you join us today for a very special event. Usually at this time, we would be in Park City, Utah, celebrating the spirit of independent cinema at the Sundance and Slamdance Film Festivals. But instead of being on Main Street, we are bringing a bit of the festival to your home today. As Director of Festival and Industry Outreach at the School of the Arts program, I get to see students' projects go from page to screen, and I've had the privilege of seeing this film grow into what you're about to see today. And it is in very good company with other films with Columbia Connections that, you, that would have been screening at Park City during this time. Films like Comforter, directed and produced by recent graduates, Cameron Bruce Nelson and Katia Sakun, respectively, and the documentary feature, Me to Play, produced and directed by Jim Fernfield, class of 2001, and shot by Saro Barjabadian, class of 2013. Both films are playing a slam dance in two weeks, and we hope you're able to join and attend online. And at Sundance, we have films like the 2021 Sundance Award winning film, Luzo, produced by Professor Ramin Burhani. Alone was Joshua Cohen, who has two projects he's produced, Land and These Days. Uh, CC alum, Alex Wolf Lewis, co-directed the documentary short, Snowy. And lastly, Bruiser, produced by current student, Laura Goatsman. More information about these films should be available in the chat now. While we wish we could be in the theater watching these films together, we are applauding their amazing work um, while we are here today. But without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our presentation for today, Doublespeak, directed by Hazel McKibben and produced by Stephanie Fine. A host of other students also worked on this film, including Jordan Anstat, Sylvia Chan, Grace Mart Merriman, Ann Shu, Ryder Laskin, Jeff Chin Cheng, Robert Jones, and Ethan Mermelstein. This is a very timely film that follows a young woman grappling with the aftermath of reporting sexual harassment in the workplace. It was featured in Short of the Week and was selected as a Vimeo staff pick, Best of the Month. So now, without further ado, I present to you Doublespeak. Sorry, I'm late. Oh, last minute change. How are you? Good to see you, Emma. All right. So, thank you all for having me back. So, Emma, when you came up to my office, I told you that I would investigate and let you know the results. Okay. Uh, Tom and Ann may chime in, but I will be sharing the report with you. Okay. okay. And I have my notes here, so I may look down from time to time, but uh, basically. Can I, can I just say one thing? Sure. Quick. Um, through this whole process, a lot of what Ben has had to research through your colleagues, um, th there's a lot of sensitive material here. And um, this, is, this is very serious. And, you know, Ben has done a, a great job in, in figuring out what it is that we need to do moving forward in, in, in this process. It's just that it's a very weighty issue. I agree. Okay, so going off what Tom was saying, I want you to know that whenever I'm asked to investigate these situations, I take them very seriously. Now, I spoke to a few of your colleagues. I looked at your written complaint as well as the attached text messages, okay? All right, so why don't we start by discussing the specific allegations? Okay, it's the document on top. Everybody have it? Yeah. First, your claim that Peter cornered you in the kitchen, blocked your exit, and asked you about sleeping your way up in the company. Now, Peter denies that this occurred. Right, well, um, I texted Elizabeth 
um, about it the same day, and I sent that to you in the email, and I think it should be in here somewhere. Yeah, Mom, I'm sorry. We just can't prove that it happened the way you say it happened. But why would I send a message like that if, if it didn't happen? I understand, but unfortunately, it's just not enough to definitively verify your claim. Okay, moving on to your allegation that Peter accosted you in the elevator. Now, he says he doesn't remember that happening. Well, isn't there footage, right? There are security cameras in the elevator, so... Yes, they have footage, but it's erased after six months. And as you waited so long to come forward, I'm afraid we just can't corroborate this allegation either. All right, let's talk about those instances where you say Peter would wait until everyone in the office left and then sit behind you in the studio while you worked, asking intimate questions. Peter has admitted that on occasion he spoke to you about subjects that may have made you feel uncomfortable. And he has acknowledged that it was inappropriate and confirmed it will never happen again. Well, that's a start. But Emma, you need to understand that this behavior does not constitute sexual harassment as defined in the company guidelines or even federal law. Now, while Peter is a senior editor, I found that he does not, in fact, has never had any direct ability to affect the terms and conditions of your employment. He's not your supervisor. Well, he was supervising my work when I was working for him. If he wasn't my supervisor, who is? Emma, as office manager, I'm always your supervisor, regardless of who you're working with on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay. Next, the timing of the complaint. There's just no credible explanation for why it would take you a year and a half to report this ongoing behavior. What was I supposed to do? Sorry. I should have reported it earlier. So, to conclude, Emma, the behavior that we can corroborate is clearly inappropriate, but it's not illegal. So I'm making the following recommendation to Tom and Ann. Peter should be instructed to avoid any communication that would have the potential of making you feel uncomfortable. And the company will make every effort so that you will not have to work with Peter again in the future. Unless it's necessary for a project. Okay, well, that concludes the report on my end. Do you have any questions, Emma? It's totally fine. Yeah, they said I'm never, I'm never gonna have to work with him again. Listen, I have a lot of work I have to get done, and um, people are probably wondering what I'm doing outside. Yeah. Okay. I'll talk to you later. I love you too. Hey, Emma. Yeah? 
Cut it again. Could we just talk about it later? Yeah. Thanks. Hey. Hey. How's it going? I'm making my way through. It's a lot of materials, so still going. Do you think you'll have by tomorrow morning? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Great. Oh, you weren't at that thing last night, right? No, no, I'm uh, working late. Uh huh. It was pretty good. Same people as last time, though. Ah, oh, well. Where are you doing? You working this weekend? We might have to have the creatives in again. Well, um, I can try to be here if you think that we'll need to do that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Maybe your clients are here. Do you want me to bring them in? Can you just have them wait at the front desk? Talk to you later. And now I'm very pleased to introduce the director and writer of Doublespeak, Hazel McKibben, and producer, Stephanie Fine. Hi. Hi, Elise. Hi. <laughs> oh, it's, so, it's funny to see the film in, in, in a Columbia context. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. Hi, Stephanie. Um, so first, congratulations to you both and the entire cast Thank and crew you. for making such an incredible film. Like I was telling y'all earlier how incredibly and personally proud of, I am of the two of you for making such an impactful film um, in such like a short amount of time. It's just like, you know, you're just, you feel every emotion. And I can, I'm sure everyone who just watched it kind of feels that kind of same emotion. So um, let's start with like something that just kind of ground us, like, you know, walk us through like the process of getting Double Speak made through the film program. And how did, you, how did the two of you meet and, got, and get this from concept, get this concept from script to screen? Yeah, well, I guess we met in the typical fashion as uh, we, we met at orientation and um, kicked things off. Uh, so it went from friendship to collaboration. Um, we produced each other's three to five minute films in the program. Um, and so kind of transitioning to a slightly larger scope project was really seamless for us. Um, Hathel came to me with this story and this is the story she wanted to tell. And um, I was on board immediately once I read the script. Um, the specificity of the language and the clarity and perspective Hazel had and was able to accomplish in telling a story based off her personal experience um, really impressed me. Yeah, we, yeah, we, we, I think we were put together in like an orientation group, right? To make the little video in the beginning, in the very beginning. So that's, it's funny, it started, started making a film um, right off the bat. Um, and then, yeah, we, um, the script, I wrote it in screenwriting one with Trey um, Ellis and then workshopped it in, in script to screen with John Walsh. And we made the film like with a mix of Columbia crew and then professionals from that I worked with on commercial sets. And, but yeah, Steph and I working together, we've always kind of worked together. So <laughs> we would have done our D4s together, but you know, COVID. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh yeah, I can uh, imagine. And, you know, and just in the kind of true spirit of collaboration, which I really love, and you can kind of feel that in the film. And um, I really appreciate that, especially with dealing with this subject matter. So um, Hazel, I know Stephanie, you mentioned about uh, Hazel, this being a story that's kind of near to your heart. Um, can you talk a more about, uh, you know, the inspiration behind like creating the story and that environment that you created on set? Yeah, um, well, the script is based on my own experience of reporting sexual harassment in the workplace. Um, actually, some of the dialogue was lifted from a recording that I made of my own very similar meeting. Um, so it, it, so it, was, it was a little hard on set. I mean, it, it wasn't, it was easy um, in the end, but I was nervous about it. And it was like, it was a super um, cathartic experience making the film. Um, and when writing the script, it was like the truth of it was uh, super important to us because I used the real name of the guy who harassed me. Um, so I wanted to, um, I didn't want to dramatize or alter any of the scenes that involved him um, because it didn't feel right to like misrepresent it. So we were sort of confined in the writing process of only dramatizing the scenes involving her alone. Um, everything else was like pretty true to what happened, although condensed for for the format. Um, and then on set, I think because we worked with so many Columbia friends and then friends outside the program, um, everybody knew like the what the script was for me. Um, and it was just like the best environment. And Steph made it so that like I could only I only had to focus on the actors um, and working with the actors and. She took care of all the production stuff, which was amazing, and let me because it was hard. The the acting, um, Angela, especially the flashback scenes, we improved. Mm -hmm. um, so we, I, I want us to be really careful about how, like how we did that because I didn't really know what what Frank, who played Peter, was going to do. Um, so yeah, we just tried to create like the most comfortable environment for like for everybody, um, given that the subject matter is like obviously a little heavy. And that's wonderful that you that you've done that because anyone who has experienced uh, sexual harassment reported it or seen it in the workplace, which unfortunately is way too many people, um, can definitely kind of feel that connection and understand like those moments <laughs> within the film. So that you perfectly captured. Um, I want to go back a little bit about you know the process of making the film. Um, obviously, as Stephanie pointed out, you know you shot the film before the pandemic, and before we knew that virtual festivals were a thing. <laughs> so what was it like finding a virtual home for this film? And Stephanie, you can start off if you don't mind. Yeah, you know, I think for a lot of filmmakers today, it was, it's been a challenge um, with, with film festivals going virtual. Um, but I would say our, uh, our path to, to Sundance was um, maybe untraditional, but very lucky. Um, and I think we're really grateful because it had found a home online um, and we knew there was an online platform for this film even before Sundance. Um, so it got into a uh, short of the week and then uh, became a Vimeo staff pick. Um, so uh, it had a virtual home. Uh, and so, you know, we understood kind of um, the short form content and, um, and online viewership. Uh, so it, it was kind of exciting, but also a seamless transition uh, for us uh, going into uh, Sundance uh, this past week. And for a reference for our audience members, um, it is very difficult to get a film into Sundance. You know, there are hunt, like tens of thousands of films that are submitted each year. And especially like even, I think it's even more, it's closer to like 50, maybe even eight, up to 80,000 short films are submitted to Sundance and only a very few spots are chosen. So what we just watched is really special. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it was funny. We did, um, we sort of did the festival thing backwards because kind of because of the pandemic, um, the online thing, we didn't know what the life of it would be. And also, you know, it was our eight to 12 and um, we didn't, not that we didn't have high hopes for it, but we just certainly didn't expect it to, um, to do this. So we, given the pandemic, we just put it out there. Um, and, you know, usually you would go to festivals and then distribution and then, um, which I've learned now, I didn't, that was the other thing, we didn't really know. So we just did it. Um, and now here it is. And yeah, the virtual festival, I feel like Sundance has done an amazing job to make it like to preserve the social aspects of it, which is obviously the part that's most lost. 
we can all watch films from home, but it's hard to like, uh, you know, lose your friends at the bar, I guess. <laughs> or standing in the long lines at the bathroom like this is the little things that we miss about you know being out in person and I want to talk a little bit more about Sundance you know tell us about like you know what you can share about you know the process of playing at Sundance or even you know talking with programmers like give us insight for people who don't know how most festivals are run or maybe they do and they want insights specifically on Sundance so I'd love to hear more about your experience at Sundance yeah um well, I, what I didn't realize was, and like Mike Plant, who I've, but who's the the head, the head of shorts programming at Sundance, um, he's been doing these like coffee, coffee things where we can just go and ask him anything. So I've been going, um, and I didn't realize that they have like 300 films that they want to play, and then it's about the program. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really like they built, they pick the first film in the program and the last film, and then build everything else in between, which was. I mean, I had no um, experience with like how, but he was very candid about it. Um, so it's interesting because it's a, it seems like it just slotted in. Um, and I mean, I remember like saying to you, Elise, like this film, no, this it's not a Sundance film. Um, and because it doesn't feel like a Sundance, it still doesn't feel like a Sundance film to me. Um, it's because, you know, they have like every festival has their own thing. Um, and it's such a straight film, I guess. Um, it didn't, but you know, it just fit nicely in the program. Um, and so it's been really amazing to like, to, to see, I guess it's kind of a crazy way to see, it's my first festival ever um, and it's virtual and it's Sundance. So it's been like a wild, kind of a wild baptism of fire, I guess. <laughs> But, you know, I think it was a learning curve for everyone involved um, and everyone on Sundance, um, but they really um, were so kind via, you know, via email. They were, you know, always on it. Um, but, you know, it was about finding new ways to network and talk to people. Um, they put you in like virtual rooms and, and chats. So it was kind of like you were at a party, but weren't. Um, but it was amazing to connect with people that were all around the world. So in, in some way it was, it still brought people together. Um, there were some glitches in the virtual system here and there, but um, everyone kind of really connected and you felt the Sundance brand um, even at home. Um, and you know, the, the blizzard in New York helped me feel like I was <laughs> in Park City. Um, so uh, it, you still felt, you still felt, uh, something you know and, and it's, it's about the films and there was a lot of awesome uh films to see that i hope uh get to reach a larger audience mm -hmm. no absolutely and i think that's the biggest thing that we're missing from festivals is this sense of community of like just kind of like bumping into people and connecting and learning about films like you don't necessarily have to be a filmmaker to like go to a film festival you get to meet people from all different backgrounds and even the conversations that will happen after this film like you know i think when we had conversations about this film um, a year ago to the day <laughs> about this particular film, one of the things was talking how to talk about a film like Double Speak. So, um, and it's like really great to be in this kind of space where we are talking about this. Um, I did have a follow-up question about, you know, um, the characters and directing and, you know, um, for Angela, who's the uh, actress who plays Emma, the main character, you know, she does such an exceptional job at conveying the, the full range of emotions, uh, um, kind of dealing with sexual harassment, um, even breaking the fourth wall, uh, looking at the screen, and I loved that touch <laughs> of like, are you, are you serious? Like, I love that reaction uh, midway through the film. Um, you know, what was it like directing Angela in those different scenes, Hazel? Like, you know, what did it feel like? I know that, you know, you know, thank goodness for Stephanie for keeping things going on the production side. But in that moment of directing, you know, what what were the things that inspired? What are the things that kind of get you grounded? We want to hear more about your experiences. Yeah, um, well, Angela, I mean, we were just so lucky to find her. She was actually, she was a recommendation from another producer in the program, Grace Merriman, who had acted with her in the NYU undergrad program. And then, you know, Grace is now with Stephanie in, the producing program and she was the first person who came into audition um and we like totally fell in love with her and then we were just like figuring out the rest of the cast around her and she had another film and we were like are we gonna get her that was a it was a whole stress um but she really connected with the material and um i i was very candid always like that it was um you know based on my own experience um so 
the way we like worked it, we did two rehearsals. Um, the first time we just talked about it. We talked about the character and the given circumstances and um, where she was like at in the, in the world of the film, because I think the first impulse was always, um, was always to be like angry and indignant about what was going on. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I was interested in like burying that and it's professional, it's work. Like you, this is still your job. You still need to, you still need to stay at this company if, if um, this all, this whole thing like goes wrong. Um, and so we really worked to like bury the, bury the emotions. Um, and then the second rehearsal, we just like, we just went for it. And we, we ran the scene a bunch and, um, and, and sort of fine tuned it and got that, like the nuances. And then by the time we got to set, um, it sort of just flowed. Um, and we had very little time <laughs> because everybody who's been on the set will be familiar with. Um, so we only ended up actually doing two takes of everything in the conference room. Um, and Angela just like, she just nailed it. Like she knew exactly what to, like how it was supposed to be. We tried a few things. We tried breaking the fourth wall and not breaking the fourth wall. Um, and ultimately that's like, that was what felt right for the film. But um, but yeah, she was amazing to work with and I felt very lucky to, to have her on board. That's awesome. I'm glad you kept that scene in because it was so perfect. And like I said, anyone who's ever reported sexual harassment or experience, um, you know, can definitely like can relate to that scene like, are you serious? Um, so we do have a question from the audience and I also wanna encourage uh, everyone, if you have questions, drop them in the uh, Q and A box. Uh, but a question for Hazel is such a powerful film, supercharged and all the more so in the hashtag Me Too era. This is a very short, but very impactful nonetheless. Many films with this theme could easily be much longer. In fact, it seems that it would be more difficult to make this kind of film in such an economical time frame. So how do you settle on deciding to tell this story in this time frame? Um, well, maybe because doing it longer might have like killed me. I don't know. I, I've always felt like I couldn't, uh, there's no feature of this and I, people keep, especially after Sundance, everybody keeps asking. Um, but it didn't feel ever like it should be a feature. Um, it was like four years of my life. And so maybe should have, there, there's material there, but, um, I don't know. It's like, it's rough. So for an, an hour and a half, two hours of, of this, I think would be, um, probably unwatchable. Um, and I also felt like um, to, to, like we picked this moment because it's the, the, the aftermath of it, like reliving it in that meeting as sort of the intersection of like, of reliving her trauma um, of everything that had happened and also like uh, sort of perpetuating it. Um, and it felt like this was the most impactful um, part of the entire experience to put on film to like have that unity of like time place and action um but yeah a feature would be would be brutal I think <laughs> I can understand that and we also have a follow-up question which I thought was actually a really interesting question was does the real Peter have any awareness of this film and has he made any response you know and hope they were hoping that it was very cathartic for you um very very fascinating question <laughs> It was, it was very cathartic for me. Um, yeah, I, yeah, making it, it just felt like the only, the best way that I could tell, I never was able to like explain how it felt to be in that situation. Um, and like, then I watched Angela and I watched the first cut and was like, oh my God, this, this is, this is how I felt. But the real Peter, I have a suspicion that he knows, <laughs> but I don't know. Um, and I don't think he would ever um, get in touch because um, yeah, I think he, I mean, I know he feels very differently. The whole, it, it was very different experience for him than it was for me. And mm -hmm. that's part of what the film explores is like the gray area between, um, between like the, what the company is saying and what she's feeling. Um, and, and yeah, it's very different across gender lines and generation, generationally. And that was part of what, what we were um, interested in. No, that's very, um, very fascinating. I feel like it was probably a lot of people feel similar <laughs> who were on set or people would have been like, let, let me, let me catch this real Peter on the streets. 
Um, so we have another question. Um, so the uh, question is, my 16-year-old daughter and I are watching the webinar together, which I think is amazing. Uh, any quick advice you can share? Or what advice would you uh, share with your 16-year-old self? And Stephanie, I actually really love to hear what you have to say about this. For my six-year-old self? Oh, wow. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, I don't know, to, to be more confident, um, to follow your, your passion and, and always go with your gut. Um, I loved film since a very young age and had no idea how to ever get into it. Um, I thought, you know, that it was something that I just would like as a hobby. Um, and little did I know that if I just um, continue to, to work in it and study it, um, that it, it's possible. Awesome. And Hazel? It's my 16 year old self. I'm, I was like the worst at 16, my mom would say. Um, I don't know. I think Stephanie's right. Like be more confident. I like this, this story is based on something that happened to me when I was 21 and I was um, still like not able to stand up for myself um, as much as I wish I had uh, now. Um, and I think, you know, like it was pretty uh, brutal reporting it and not, not having any kind of justice, but I don't regret um, ultimately um, saying how I felt and being honest. Um, and I think, and now, and now here we are. So um, I think, yeah, be honest with yourself and others and, and stand up for yourself if you need, if you need to um, in the filmmaking world and outside of it, because, um, you know, nobody will if, if you don't. And don't be scared to speak up. Is, uh... Oh, yes, absolutely. Even when it costs you, even if it costs you everything, because, you know, Hazel and I were, um, and Stephanie, when we were talking initially about this project, I had shared that, you know, I even experienced sexual harassment in the workplace and I spoke up and it cost me my job. Um, but now I have a wonderful job in a world of community where I'm able to share this story. So like, you know, even it's like terrifying to speak up. Like if you learn nothing from the short or the our, our lives, like it's important to find that voice. And I'm really happy that y'all have found this voice in this film. So um our next question is two questions. <laughs> so let's see if we can um, put it together. But like, I think this kind of goes together. So kind of what were the biggest challenges in the process of making this film? Were they like kind of, were they budgetary? You know, did you finance the film? You know, uh, you can talk about what this film was in the program and how you made, like kind of following up a little bit more of the nuance of getting a film made <laughs> as a film student. <laughs> So I think this is what the question is asking. What are some of the biggest challenges? Yeah, totally. Um, well, so a little bit about the Columbia H12 thing. Um, it's, we made this film at the end of our first year. Um, there's a budget of $2,500, um, which is tiny for films, um, like absolutely tiny. And um, I feel pretty proud that we actually made it for that much, although maybe a bit over because we took everyone out to dinner after to say thank you for working for free. Um, so that was a challenge. The budget was a challenge, making it within, um, the, within the scope of what the Columbia project was. But um, that was important to us. And I feel like ultimately, like, it is a very tight film. We shot it in two locations. Um, that was another challenge, making the two look like one um, and finding them, finding office space in New York City is like horrible. Um, but ultimately I feel um, pretty, it made the film better to, to have those constraints, to be, to be really like tight about it. Um, and there, there was like a larger version of the story, like the first script I wrote was a lot more complicated and we actually cut scenes for the final edit. So, um, Ultimately, I think the tight, the constraints made it a stronger film. But Stephanie can speak more to the production challenges because we had some. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you know, it, finding an office space in New York uh, for free is is uh, a huge challenge. Um, we emailed so many, so many spaces, like hundreds of hundreds places. Of spaces. Stephanie emailed hundreds, <laughs> um, just everywhere. And then you know, trying to find um, the right look. Because I, you know, I, you know, and 
Hazel had a really strong vision of, of what she wanted to, to see visually. And um, that was super important, I think, to the integrity of the script and the project. So we, uh, we were trying to find uh, enough office space that, that fit kind of the, the visuals for the film. Um, but yeah, we, and we found two, uh, luckily, um, and they, they worked well together uh, and we had an amazing um, production designer on set who um, her, her attention to detail was, was really amazing in, in connecting the spaces um, and, and, and br bringing out the details. Um, but yeah, keeping on budget, um, it, it was a, it was a small budget, um, you know, and what we, I think we correctly partitioned out things. Um, but yeah, I think getting locations for free was our biggest, um, saver in, in that sense. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, t time is, is, is always the toughest thing. I think Hazel spoke to, spoke to really well that. Um, I think the constraints were super helpful in so many ways. Um, but yeah, you know, looking back, um, I, I, I often think how crazy it was we shot that in, in only two days. Um, it, 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 it's kind of insane. Um, but yeah, I would say overall, it was fairly a smooth production um, during yeah. the thing. Um, but uh, pickups and drop offs in that U haul around <laughs> all of men, all of New York City was not so smooth, but you know, <laughs> just Stephanie and I, like, I mean, it was a true student. That's what part of why it's yeah. so amazing. It went to Sundance. It's like a true student film um, in, in every <laughs> respect. And it was a complete learning curve. And, and you know, we had both, you know, um, our peers as well as people who have been working in the industry for a, a many years. Um, so it was so nice to kind of work so well together and um, feel really prepared. And I think Columbia prepared all of us to do it. Um, so it, it was it was fairly uh, a seamless um, team in that sense. Yeah, and that's beautiful. And I love what you said about you know budgetary constraints also lead to like some of the best things about the film like you know I didn't know you only had like one location or finding it so difficult to find office space but I think the office space is absolutely perfect because it was an open office and we had an open there's like the, these kind of underlying kind of things happening or, or they're out in the open so I think the the it's there and I, I love that I didn't realize that about the film but that was something that just made the most amount of sense of being in an open office because <laughs> if you had a cubicles I think it would have been a very different film yeah, uh, totally. different feel uh so speaking of like that kind of like the meanings of um kind of like the representation in the film like how did you decide on the title of the film <laughs> oh my god <laughs> that was a that was the thing that was decided last at least i'm sure you saw every version you saw had a different title mm -hmm. um yeah the title was hard the title was really hard because um we didn't want it to be melodramatic or um too sentimental I think that's like was super important about the film is that nothing about it. I didn't want anything to be sentimental because I think like too often like uh, representation, like women are portrayed as victims or, and it's, it gets too like emotionally um, uh, charged. She's not, I mean, she's a victim, but she's not, she's like owning this, this, she's making a choice to stay and a choice to report. And um, so double speak originally was called fracture. Was that the first title? Which yeah. was too sentimental um and double speak just felt the more like we watched edits and the more i edited the film um because uh, jordan um who's also a director at columbia um did worked on the initial edits and then after crit week um when we were all in second year and like had no time i kind of finalized and and cut a lot from that um office scene and mostly we were trying to figure out how to cut the language and it became really about language for me and then Double speak and this like it's it it spoke um, no pun intended to like the 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 subtext and the nuances um, and the like what's beneath the surface um, and how they say one thing and mean another and then once we landed on it it just like it fit but it there were a lot of title options <laughs> there were quite a few titles um, in between but yeah just it, nothing had really um, hit you know nothing yeah felt really right. Um, which is which is interesting, but I, you know, it was exciting to to really to land on uh, land on the title. We we felt kind of um, 
worked best um and like like you said um, was not overly um dramatic mm -hmm. no that's good to know and there was a follow-up question i had to the previous one about like you know some of the constraints and everything like um and also also want to point out uh going back to sundance here the fact that y'all had kind of made this film and like, you know, as like a true student film, like the films that, just to give audience members a little bit of context, the films that are playing at Sundance, these short films have massive budgets. You know, they're professional short filmmakers and they're like out here, they can get, you know, all kinds of things. <laughs> and they were able to do it with such, you know, with such little, and it's really powerful. But the follow-up question I had um, to our early question about uh, um, constraints is like, how in the world did you get the office space for free? <laughs> Well, I'll talk about one and then stuff because it was actually two offices that we edited together. Um, one office, what they're, it's this, uh, they're an agent, they rep commercial directors um, and production companies called Uncle Lefty. And I worked with them when I was an editor um, and I had helped them work on a film out in Rhode Island with their families. So then I emailed them and was like, hey, can I borrow it for a day? And they were like, yeah, as long as you want. And then the other one, um, Stephanie's hard work. Yeah, um, it was just, we were emailing um, a bunch of places um, and kind of, you know, we, we thought what, what a better way, but then to look for like more female driven um, companies as well. So we kind of focused in on that after kind of looking everywhere. Um, and we found a lovely um, company in Brooklyn uh, called Warren. Um, they were a, uh, they, they're no longer around, but they were like a female led um, marketing agency. So um, they were just so kind to just let us film there um, f for free. Um, and they, the, the family like lived above uh, in, in their apartment above the office space, but um, it, it was, it was so nice. Um, they like let us use their garage to hold equipment. And um, yeah, it was just, it was just luck. It, it was, um, no, not luck. It was lots of emailing. <laughs> you did a lot of work. <laughs> yes, do not diminish the amount of work that went into this film. <laughs> there was a lot because, you know, it's, a, it's, you know, people see the final product and be like, oh my gosh, it's so nice. You don't see the blood, sweat, and tears that have gone into some of these projects just starting off as a, as a student project. But if you kind of move on and, and other, making other films, especially in the independent world, it's, it is a lot of work. It's a lot of like that, Lots of disappointments, lots of no's, lots of doors shut in the face. So to see the success of this, and I can't reiterate this enough, how amazing it is and how like, we call it luck, but like it's, it's hashtag blessed. <laughs> so um, so I have, a, I have a really like fascinating question from one of our um, male participants. And I, I kind of really wanted to bring this up because I always appreciate when I hear this is, hi, Hazel and Stephanie, you both have inspired me so much and I haven't finished my first year in the program yet. With doublespeak, I feel there is something I must do as a man to help, because it's so obvious, to me at least, that we're facing a societal, systemic, and cultural crisis about this. It's more than just a single case of victim slash abuser. Is there anything you would like for me and other male viewers to take from the film? Um, I think to start, like, just believe women when they tell you um, they've had experiences like that. I mean, yeah that's like the the easiest um um it's not the easiest because there, it's complex but it's the the best place to start I think is somebody tells you that they've had an experience like that just to to believe them and um and first mm -hmm. and to to listen you know um I think you know listening you know I think Hazel uh, you know kind of mentioned that there was this gray area that that she kind of that we explore in double speak um and I think just listening to other perspective and, and understanding, um, you know, I think it helped clarify uh, kind of the, that area. Mm -hmm. No, and that's important. Listen to women. Listen, yeah. listen, and and providing the space, like you know, just saying like, okay, get out, get out. Sometimes this is my favorite saying: get out your own way. <laughs> Sometimes you just have to kind of get out the way and just like let. Um, let women speak, let people speak who are marginalized, who don't have a privilege, using your privilege to help others, like. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> it goes a long, long way. And it's something that, you know, 
is still in the film industry, you know, whether this happened, um, you know, whether we experienced sexual harassment in the film industry, outside the film industry, I think it's just across the board where, you know, I don't like, um, and I know we had a question about, you know, even with your own um, experience that led to this film, you know, Hazel, whether it's, it was in the film industry or not. And, you know, even if it wasn't, <laughs> it was. It was. <laughs> Because I was it like, was. I, well, I think when I first watched the film, I, I was like, wait a second, I recognize this. And it was, I've experienced sexual harassment in the film industry. So that's really fascinating that, um, that this definitely was, did happen in the film industry. And it happened. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very male dominated industry, uh, like, like most. Um, and yeah, I think, um, yeah, male dominated power dynamics are huge. Um, and that's the thing. It's not just women. It's like, I think it's really a power issue rather than a gender issue. Um, so yeah, that exists a lot in the film industry. Although the more women that we can, we're trying bringing up through, um, I think the better it'll get. Yes. And more films like this, <laughs> I think is also very important, you know, and telling you the story this way. Um, and in, in such a beautiful way as well. And we have a question that, you know, wanted to hear more about like the production value and, you know, how was the film shot? Like what cameras, like what equipment like, kind of gave it that really kind of like, there was like a rawness to the film. So I want to know more about like, how did you achieve that look in the film? Yeah, um, our DP was this uh, woman, Allison Anderson, who's amazing and I love. Um, we worked together initially. Um, she was an operator on some commercial sets that I worked on. Um, she started in the commercial world and is like moving into film now. Um, we shot on an Alexa Mini with Zeiss Super Speed lenses. Um, and we chose to shoot in 4.3. Um, aspect ratio because we wanted it to feel confined and then we also wanted it to feel really like cold and clean and crisp um and Allison and I just talked I, sh I shared some like images with her like Nan Golden photographs Ren Hang photographs and um and we talked a little bit about like how the camera language um would work and how static um it was it was yeah how like confined and you know claustrophobic we kind of built everything to sort of be like that um and then like the pan across kind of the the, the betrayal um and the yeah sort of the turn in the film um but yeah Allison's amazing and she really like she made she made it look the way that it looks it's yeah we also had um, great post production as well um we had yeah. um some really talented uh colorists and, and um sound mixers as well mm. No, that's awesome. And kudos for having a woman DP, like that is director of photography. That's incredible. And I, I'm still stuck in the office space <laughs> about also the glass that's in there, uh, the open space and the glass is just, it just, it just makes the film just, it just elevates the film basically. And then the messaging of the film. So still- <laughs> We were lucky to get that. <laughs> we were actually hiding a very large um, pool table uh, yeah, we we're in the, in like basically on a pool table. <laughs> <laughs> You've heard it here first, folks. <laughs> behind what behind the scenes really looks like with filmmaking. Um, and, you know, I, uh, I have a, like about two more questions. So if there's anybody on the Q&A who has, you know, one or two questions, we're gonna probably wrap up soon. So I have like about two more questions. You know, one of the questions was um, kind of talking more about like making this film, like going back to like the script phase and uh, helping people understand um, kind of what it, it takes to be in the film program and everything. Was there a specific prompt that led to this film assignment or, you know, in your classroom, was it kind of like right from your experience or talk to us a little bit about like the process um, of the script starting off with there. Yeah, um, it was screenwriting one. I think we were we had to write a three to five minute film, a ten, a eight to twelve minute, eight to ten, and then ten to twelve. And this was just one of the scripts I wrote. Um, and we chose to take it. I had written another one that had similar themes, um, but was and also based on my. I just tend to write from my own experience. I know like some people really don't like doing that, but I can't. Other, I don't know. I don't know. Everything I write just seems to like be in somehow um, based on my own life. 
And the other script that I had written was involved like driving around New York City for the entire thing. It was just very unproducible <laughs> at the scale of the of the of what we needed it to be for our eight to twelve. Um, and so so I decided like this was the one. And also I felt like um, this experience had dominated my life for like four years. Um, and I felt like I couldn't make another film without making this one. Like, like somehow the material would kind of like permeate everything else I made until I made this. Like I just needed to like exercise it from, from my, I don't know, film, like whatever my ideas or creative like headspace. Um, and then Stephanie worked with me a lot on the script um, after the first draft. Um, and maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, um, so I, I guess also um, for every eight to 12, you also do script to screen. Um, so that's kind of like the last um, sort of finessing of it. But um, yeah, I mean, it, you know, with, like I said, we kind of started luckily our collaboration early. So like I was getting like first, you know, drafts of, of the script. Um, but yeah, it was really, um, about kind of just figuring out the the, the dialogue um, because I you know there were so many so much like legal terminology and getting the contrast between between that and in the real language I think was a, a huge kind of task for us um, but super exciting um, and I think it just made it feel so much more real and, and raw and um, we even had you know she showed me you know a lot of the terms that were used and um, it's still, it's very true to um, what, you know, you would be, you know, would hear. Um, and I, I thought that was really important to keeping to the story. Um, and a lot of it also with working with, getting to work with Angela was amazing because, um, you know, when she was talking to her mother, some of that is, you know, um, also just kind of her being in the role and um, improvising and, um, so kind of we made you know little changes on set as well that, that felt natural uh, to her in that moment. So um, you know, Hazel working with the actors, I think also really clarified things and, and what um, worked and what didn't. Um, so you know we were lucky to uh, find a great cast, um, but it was definitely a challenge having so many actors on set. Um, but I think you know she did an amazing job directing them and, and uh, I think they all really worked well off each other and with the dialogue. Yeah, um, and that's awesome. And speaking of actors, um, you know, can you talk about like, you know, the ca casting of the like two older men and the older woman in the meeting room? And did you consider other characters for that scene? Or like, you know, what was it like working with the actors outside of Angela? Yeah, we didn't consider other, I mean, that was always the cast because that was what was, what my meeting was. Um, so because it was so based on my own experience, um, I was kind of fixed on that. And also I thought it was important. Um, it felt important for these two like middle-aged white men to be the ones um, like kind of together. And we shot them like that, like they're together and then the woman is separate. Um, mm -hmm. And then she's kind of in the middle. Um, and yeah, the cast was just, they were amazing. They were, I think like, it was funny working with them because they're all older than me, you know, and they're all like SAG actors. They've worked with, they've worked a lot. Um, so it was really, um, I felt like I had to earn their trust in the beginning, but um, but yeah, I just helped talking about my experience. And once they knew that it was so personal and like trusted me, then then um, then it was, it was amazing to work with them. And they are like total pros. And that definitely comes through the screen. Um, and you're a total pro too. <laughs> um, and my last question that I have for this evening, kind of, um, there's a question that came through the Q and A that kind of ties into uh, one of my last questions. Is not just like what's next, but like you know, like words of wisdom, like you know, what we talked about your 16 year old self, like you're you're about to graduate from the film program or graduating soon. And in the season of like the pandemic and social distancing, like, you know, what would you recommend towards like young artists who build community? How do you build community? You know, what are the resources that you, that you have seen and or what you would like to kind of make those next steps into the industry? So in closing, we just want to hear from you about, you know, what's going on. <laughs> Stephanie, you start. Um, well, I'm, I'm currently interning um, at Film Movement. Um, and so, you know, 
interning is has been a is, is an awesome way to just keep in the industry and you know while I'm preparing for my uh, thesis. Um, but uh, to tell my future self is is to keep to keep going to keep working. Um, Columbia is amazing, and that I found collaborators I will work with. I'm sure for years on after um, film school. So, you know, my, my goal is to keep making projects and to, to find um, feature financing, um, you know, um, but right now it's, uh, yeah, you know, waiting to uh, hopefully um, get back out and film things, make things. Yeah, um, I'm working on I'm shooting a, f a short in March in the UK, and then my thesis, um, hopefully COVID allowing in July. Um, and then I'm developing two features in a TV pilot. Um, one's kind of in line with double speak tonally and the other a little bit more in line with my thesis film. Um, so, you know, just, just working on those scripts and then um, in pre-pro for the shorts. And as far as like, um, community during the pandemic is, um, you know, like build, you build your own community and um, sort of keep involved in been doing a lot of writers groups, like through Columbia and revision classes, but also outside of Columbia. Um, we really have such an amazing network through, through the program and even through like bringing in people we know outside the program. It's like, just, just arrange a time with like people that you, whose opinions you respect and whose work you like and, 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 you know, set each other deadlines and like work together is such an amazing way to like create community beyond the program. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of um, advice for filmmakers or like, I don't know, I mean, for me, like I just, I think it's scripts are always best if they're like super specific, which all your Columbia professors will tell you. Um, and they also all say to like write what you know, and I don't necessarily know that you need to write what you know, but right rooted in like an emotion that you feel you've that feels resonant with you and um i think as long as like it 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 comes from you um and comes from an emotionally rooted in something that that feels real to you is always going to be good and then have fun because you know it's like films are it's not supposed to be we're not like saving lives we're just making movies you know it's like it should just be fun on set um it should never feel like it should be hard but fun no, and that's really beautiful. And I'm glad you said that. I mean, y'all are already inspiring. You know, like I said, a year ago, y'all inspired me. And even in, we have one uh, question that came through from Kevin Lee, who said, um, you know, Stephanie really inspired um, Kevin to uh, apply for the program. And, you know, back in fall 2019. So he's a current student working on his own project. So you've already, you're already inspiring people, not only, you know, through what you're just being in school and through these films, but like through your lives and the stories that you tell. So, you know, um, not only thank you for that, but thank you for today. Thank you for sharing your film with us. You know, we greatly appreciate it. Um, you know, thank I you so much. <laughs> thank you yeah so and thank I, you for and i remember talking to you about the program um elise I, thank you for championing the film like from start to finish yes of thank course. you so much elise um yeah. you, you know you've you've made the the film festival world um a little less scary um for us um and have really um given us some really amazing advice and have been super helpful on that front um so so thank you for that Oh, that's nice. It's a love fest today, y'all. <laughs> um, so like I said, and thank you to all the participants, everyone who uh, joined our conversation, joined our screening, you know, um, we have more amazing things coming up, you know, um, we hear your interest is in film, we're going to try to provide as many fun film things as possible. So our next Columbia at Home um, series is going to include filmmaker and School of the Arts faculty member, Ramin Barhani, who also is a CC grad, 96, who's going to discuss his new film, The White Tiger, on Thursday, February 11th at 6.30 Eastern time, PM Eastern time. Um, so once again, thank you everyone and have a lovely, warm, <laughs> safe evening. <laughs>